along the same theme I was talking about earlier. And uh, so that the, uh, the balance uh, between um, acceptance and direction in our meditation practice. So the, <coughs> the first principle or the basic assumption that we bring to bear is that both of these things are necessary. It's necessary to have a quality of acceptance. Uh, it's also necessary to have uh, a direction. And these things appear to be um, there appears to be some kind of tension between them. Acceptance means you're happy to be where you are, and direction means you want to get somewhere else. And so at some level there's a dynamic or there's a tension there. Okay? Now that tension, there's nothing wrong with that tension. That simply reflects the fact that uh, our minds and the situation that we're in is in fact complex and, complex and diverse, and there's no one solution to those things. There is an active and a passive side of existence. And our meditation uh, reflects both of those. So rather than, <coughs> rather than trying to uh, reify or emphasize one particular aspect or other of those to an extreme degree, um, it's much better to appreciate both and to understand, to learn how to understand and apply each one when it's necessary. And if we look around us in the spiritual world and the world of meditation and so on and so forth, then it's not difficult to find places where one or other of those seems to be uh, emphasized very greatly. So some meditation teachers are very, very much goal-orientated. Right? You've got to sit for 10 hours a day or you've got to do this and you've got to watch your tip of your nose and if your mind moves even a little bit, that's wrong. You've got to watch that, watch that, watch that and you've got to get the, the limiter and then you've got to go into that, you've got to get your jhanas, and once you've got your jhanas, you've got to do the insight, and then you've got to become a stream enterer, and you've got to aim for stream entry in this very life, right? So that's one way of talking, and that's a very good way of talking, yeah? That's a very no-nonsense way of talking. It's a very way of talking which, which uh, uh, stops us from making excuses and, and stops us from messing around focuses and sharpens our mind and clarifies what exactly are we doing here. So that's very good. And all of those things are very true. So this is one aspect of our meditation practice. We need to forget everything, throw everything out, and focus just on that one thing. Whether that be the breath or the metta or whatever it is, doesn't matter. The meditation object doesn't matter so much. But it's the, the dedication to that. You have to be ready to give your life for your meditation. When anything happens, it's not as important as your meditation. When Ajahn Brahm went on retreat a few years ago, he spent six months in his hut on retreat, and his instructions were to the, <coughs> to the monks, don't come and get me for anything, even if the world ends. <laughs> so even if there's a nuclear war, I don't care. I'm just going to watch my breath, all right? So that's why Ajahn Brahm has such good meditation. 
that when he comes to sit meditation, that's just that one thing. And if you focus on that with that single-minded attention, then you see the path unfolds itself within you. Step by step, just like it says in the books. So all of those things that it says in the books and the meditation manuals, they're all real. The different stages of meditation, you watch the breath, clarify, be aware of the, 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 the in-breath and the out-breath, be aware of the full length and, and uh, 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 full span of the breath, tranquilizing the breath, the appearance of the nimitta, the bright light, that comes up within the breath and that's associated with feelings of rapture and joy. The mind unifying, coming into one with that and entering into that experience of oneness. That experience of oneness deepening and deepening and deepening into a world of bliss and light and then the emergence from that world with understanding and seeing that not only is this body impermanent, not only are my thoughts impermanent, not only are my feelings impermanent, but consciousness itself is impermanent, cannot be trusted. And then the deep level insights that lead to awakening. And those stages, they happen. The books are not presenting a fable they're not presenting a story of the past ages of something that's disappeared. And this is one of the great lies of modern Buddhism in many Buddhist countries that they will tell you that awakening is not possible. Don't believe them. If somebody tells you awakening is not possible, you only know one thing. That person is not awakened. And if they're not awakened, don't trust them. Yeah. The Buddha has said that awakening is possible. Yeah. The things that make awakening possible are just it's the same things now as they were in the past. Abandoning the five hindrances of the mind. We know what the five hindrances are. We can recognize them. Sensual desire, aversion, uh, uh, Sloth and torpor, doubt, restlessness and, and remorse. These are uh, uh, a mental uh, properties of our mind. They're activities, they're things that are going on, that we're doing. We can recognize those things now just as people could in the Buddha's day. They haven't changed. Nothing's changed about the five hindrances. And as we can recognize them, we can recognize that they are impermanent, that they come and go. And we can understand that when these forces overpower our minds, they lead us to do things that cause suffering. And we can recognize that when they pass away from the mind and the mind is free, that it becomes light, it becomes at ease, it becomes spacious, it becomes awake. We can see that within ourselves. We don't need to, to, to believe that on blind faith. And so recognizing these qualities within ourselves <clears throat> is a huge and crucial step towards being able to uh, uh, transform and transcend them, to go beyond. So this is this is this idea of the the path as a um, as a series of stages that we go through. And so, of course, the idea of a path is just a metaphor, right? There is no path, okay? You don't walk along anything. What we mean when we say that there's a path is we mean that if you're, it's a metaphor. It says that, well, what do you do on a path? Well, you, you, you go gradually step by step, little bit by little bit along there, and you start in one place and you end up in another place. So that's the kind of idea, that's what we mean when we say that there's a path. And it's not actually anything. It just means that if you're practicing, and you keep practicing little bit by little bit, gradually the mind changes, just like the scenery changes as you're walking along the path. 
And if you keep a clear idea of what the goal is, a clear orientation that you're going towards that goal, then you can get there. If you just, that's the difference between walking along a path and then just going for a stroll in the park or something where you, you're not trying to get to any destination. So when we're practicing for a spiritual goal, we have an idea of what that goal is. Now, of course, in Buddhism, we call the goal Nibbana. And being typically Buddhist, Nibbana means not something. <laughs> so, not... And we don't even quite know what the something is, right? So Nibbāna usually refers to the going out of a flame. Yeah? So th this is the basic meaning of Nibbāna is like finding coolness and finding stillness. But it's presented in a negative. So whenever we try to define Nibbāna and pin it down, the mind slides off it. It's like it's made of Teflon. Right? Nibbāna is made of Teflon-coated ball bearings. Just the mind slips off it whenever you try to get hold of it. There it goes, oh, it's gone again. And so, unlike uh, most religions, which give you a, a relatively clearly defined, see the problem is if you if you if you when you make the goal of a religious practice clear and straightforward. Right? You can say, well, you go to heaven and you join the celestial choir and you know you fly around with wings and play the harp and hang out with God and so on, and it, it, it's you know, or you know you go and you get you get like dates and virgins and things like that under the palm trees if you're a Muslim, and all these kind of, then the, the very fact that you can describe it in concrete terms means that it becomes a bit silly, yeah, and. And so, so there's, this, there's this continual progress where, of course, if you speak to a Christian or a Muslim or something like that who has any deep appreciation of their own religion, then, of course, they'll say to you, well, yeah, it's not really like that, okay? That's just a way of putting it, yeah? It's not really like you're up there with a choir and you're sort of going to choir practice every afternoon and that's what, <laughs> that's what heaven's like. And so it, it takes on higher and higher meanings. It's like it, it, it withdraws from the, the material and from the concrete into a more and more abstract realm. But, the, but of course, the more it withdraws, the more it becomes inaccessible, the more, the more uh, that, that it's hard to understand. And so there's a tendency to want to draw it back into the world again, to make it more concrete, more realistic. So we find that very much within Buddhism, that the, the way the Buddha formulated the goal of Nibbāna was very, very abstract. And it's great for philosophers, yeah? but not necessarily so good for ordinary folks who, who want something a bit more tangible. And so we find that inexorable tendency within Buddhism to either lower the goal of Buddhism so that it's aiming for a rebirth in some kind of heaven or something, or else to kind of redefine Nibbāna in more concrete, substantial terms. This is a kind of tendency within Buddhist philosophy over the millennia. So we, we know what the goal is, Nibbāna, but we know, don't quite know what it is. But what we should know is that the Buddha always painted Nibbāna in very glowing terms. It's the shelter, the harbour, the refuge, Sivan, the, the sublime, the peaceful, ultimate bliss, Paraman Sukhan. free of all limitations, all measures. And so this should be enough for us to, to be interested in it, to take an interest, to walk the path there. And as we go further and further on the path, then our understanding, our appreciation of Nibbāna will deepen and our motivation will become more clear. So this is that one aspect of practice, that one aspect of practice that says we've got to, we're in suffering, we're in samsara, we have defilements, we've got to work and do things in a, in a, in a concrete, methodical way to c overcome those defilements. If we see ha hatred, we have to develop love and kindness to abandon that. If we see 
that we're, we're afflicted with uh, excessive lust or, or desire or something that's causing problems, then we need to develop letting go and non-attachment. If we see uh, that we have a lot of greed for things, then we have to develop contentment. If we see we have um, a lot of uh, cynicism and negativity in our mind, we have to develop positive, uh, wholesome states of mind, all of these things. So, so this is that, that like positivistic and constructive side of Buddhism, that we, we, we are actively doing things in order to overcome the existing problems. So that's one side of the story. Okay. Now the other side of the story, which and and I mentioned that 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 particular approach, you know, you'll find emphasized by certain teachers. Yeah. So there are different teachers who emphasize those kinds of things, and and according, of course, to their own personality. And there are other teachers who who maybe emphasize something quite different. And you go to hear them, and they'll just say, just let go. Striving just brings you more suffering. There is no path. Yeah, you find things like the Heart Sutra. There, there's no path. You just have to be. You just have to be awake. You are awake already, but you don't realize it. And so this whole other uh, aspect of teachings, <coughs> which is also true and also has its validity and also has its foundation in the Buddha's teachings. Because as I mentioned earlier, if we're taking exclusively or excessively focusing on the goal-orientated or path-orientated model, the very fact that we're here, we want to be there, there's this tension between us being here and where we want to go. Now, that tension is not a bad thing if it's moving us in the right direction, but it, it, it um, depends on how it manifests and how it works. If, if the tension is excessive, if that gap between where we're at and where we want to be is excessive, then that can be very damaging. You imagine, you imagine like it's, you know, you're connected with an elastic band, yeah? So you're here, you've got a rubber band, I'm, I'm here, full of defilements, and there's Nibbana over there. Now, if I've got too many defilements here, and I'm focusing only on Nibbana over there, the band's going to snap, yeah? And that's what happens, okay? And that is not infrequent, right? Then people go mad, right? Have a breakdown, they suffer from depression because you're not where you're at. You, you, you think I should be there and I'm not. Uh, you, you end up reinforcing negative uh, states of mind and ways of thinking. You, 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 t you tell yourself you're not worthy. You keep on pushing yourself, pushing yourself to be a better person, all of these kinds of things. And you're, you're not con you don't accept the reality of who you are, all of these things, and that can snap. So what you need, rather than that huge gap of things, is you need, you know, and, and, and sometimes we hear, we hear things like the Buddha, you know, he sort of sits all night to meditate and he's going to, I'm going to get enlightened. So you think I'm going to do, do the same thing. But yeah, I mean, he could actually do it. Like he was quite realistic. He's, he said, I'm going to sit here and meditate all night and get enlightened. And it was a perfectly realistic assessment of his own spiritual capabilities. Yeah. It's like Muhammad Ali, right? Muhammad Ali says, I'm the greatest. Yeah. He's not boasting. He's actually just giving a realistic assessment of his own capabilities. He really was the greatest. Yeah? So for him to say that was entirely mundane. Yeah? Well, he's just acknowledging, I, I am in fact the greatest. So this is what the Buddha was in fact the greatest. And if he said it, it's because he was. Yeah? And if we try to do that same thing, we're going to snap like that rubber band. Yeah? And so the Buddha, you know, we're like that and with the rubber band so tense. The Buddha was like here already, you know, the <laughs> rubber band. He's like, so it's a bit different, yeah? So what we have to do is, of course, we have to focus on the next stage. Where do I need to go from here? What do I actually need to go there? Yeah? And going step by step. And we keep in mind that overall focus, right? We keep in mind that, yes, there is this orientation towards Nibbana. Each step takes us along that way. So we don't forget that. We don't neglect it. But we're not just trying to hop from there to there. That's too much. Yeah. So 
then the, the flip side of that comes in and that flip side of it tells us it's not just sort of looking, gazing at the sky and saying there's Nibbana over there, but it's saying, well, where are we here now? Right? What, what situation are we actually in right now? And to accept that, I feel greed, hatred, delusion, that's all right. Greed, hatred, and delusion is normal, okay? <laughs> it's all right, <laughs> yeah? Anger is normal, jealousy is normal, rage is normal. All of these things are normal, it's okay. Yeah? This is being part of being human. So you kind of accept it, you, what does it feel like? Yeah? You learn what these things feel like. They have, they have an action, rather than, rather than trying to, oh, I shouldn't have it and trying to put it aside and trying to get something you have, what actually is that? Try to accept it. And even um, that, but what you find is that um, when that acceptance happens with enough, enough clarity and space that, that actually it's, it feels very pleasant. Even if, even if the actual emotion itself is quite unpleasant, uh, even if it's like depression or sadness or something like that, then you can accept that and be with that, and it actually feels very beautiful. Right? There's a depth to it. There's a depth to the acceptance, which is not—it's not a happiness, but there's a, there's a kind of a pleasure or a contentment that comes from the the depth of acceptance of whatever that is, and and, and sometimes even more so with with very painful things. If you if you can have the space to accept things that are very difficult and very painful. And it, is it, there's, a, there's a tremendous sense of relief that comes from that. And, and this, this sense of... Um, great sense of, of uh, inner honesty and sincerity that, that you're, you're not trying to pretend to be anything. So, you know, we have, we were talking a little bit earlier about Mara, and of course Mara in Buddhism, the tempter being the one who's always putting on some kind of show, the master of disguises, yeah? So you're always trying to pretend to be something. And Mara comes in many different kinds of guises to you. But that's also a little bit how we, we present to the world and we also present to ourselves. We try to, to, to present, we, we internalize our own inner image of ourselves. Who am I? You know, it's what we call this like the identity or self view. And so in, this, in that acceptance, we're learning the, um, we're learning the kind of the, the ways that we make these disguises. What, what kinds of faces do we want to present to the world? And we're, we're becoming familiar with that. What's driving that? What's the motivation? And to understand these things uh, takes a tremendous amount of stillness yeah? and quietness these things they come and go they're very delicate thoughts come and go feelings emotions all of these things they're very subtle and if you're in there trying to fix them all the time trying to do something to them right then you never really get to know them okay. I'm not saying don't get in there and try to fix them I'm just saying don't do that all the time so this is two very different modes or approaches in our meditation and we should do both of them at different times Eventually, ultimately, they'll unify. Yeah? They'll become just the same. You will have that complete acceptance, and that complete acceptance will be completely dedicated and directed onto the, to the goal of the practice. Those two things become one. There is no ultimately no distinction between them. But in a pragmatic sense, when we're working with our everyday mind, both of those things need to be done at different times. We work with them. And so all of those tricks that we use to overcome greed, hatred, and delusion in their various manifestations, they're all just kind of um, cheap tricks, really. They're just things we use along the way to, to, to manage the situation and, and, 
and keep it workable. But the real thing that does the job is awareness itself. That's the most powerful. So if we can find that space within us to sort of get disentangled from the, the naughtiness and the twistedness of experience and just sort of get a bit more perspective on things, that power of awareness itself that's shining when that's allowed to, to be and to accept and to know, everything is fuel for it. Everything is learning. Yeah? Everything is information. Everything is teaching you. Yeah? This because this classic saying Ajahn Chah said when one of the monks went to stay in a monastery and uh, they were just by themselves and Ajahn Chah came to visit them and he said, you know, he was just a junior monk and the monk, he said to the monk, how are you going? And he said, terrible. He said, why is that? He said, because I don't have a teacher. And Ajahn Chah said, what do you mean? He said, you've got six teachers. And the monk said, what are you talking about? I'm staying here by myself. He said, Ajahn Chah said, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind. <laughs> six. Yeah. So they're always teaching us every moment. You look through your eyes. What's that teaching you now? It's impermanent. It's suffering. It's not self. It's empty. Let go of it. That's teaching you. That's a perfect lesson. It's conditioned reality. Your ears are teaching the same thing. Yeah, this, this is the present moment. Your ears are pointing you to the present moment all the time. They're alerting you to the present moment. That's what they do. So these things, these are teachers. are there constantly to guide us and to remind us of the Dhamma. So this is again to remind you of, of uh, what I mentioned before about the, this idea that, that uh, the purpose of Buddhism is to protect you from the Dhamma. to hide away the Dhamma, it's to externalize it. We don't have to actually awaken because, well, the, see, we, the Buddha's awakened, so that's good enough. Dhamma, oh yeah, we know Dhamma, it's that thing which is locked in the cabinet, which is kept on the shrine. Yeah, that's what Dhamma is. All the answers are there. You just need to find somebody with the key. So we can externalize everything. We put that out. So this Buddhism is this, this, this cultural construct which cages the Dhamma, tames it, makes it acceptable. You know, it's really quite an extraordinary thing if you think about it. You know, here you've got this, this wandering ascetic in, in India, you know, who just wander around and stay in the forest and teach people about the complete ending of existence. Yeah, and uh, somehow he becomes the the, the 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 mainstay that that kind of buttresses the institution, the most conservative traditional institutions in 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 big societies in the modern world. I mean, how do you get from that one thing to the other? Yeah, it's very kind of um, odd if you think about it. So Buddhism job is to tame the Dhamma, to contain it, keep it safe. Yeah? And so our job is to break through that. Okay? So we have to break through Buddhism and try to reach the truth. So it's very important and one of the greatest uh, failings and problems in, 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 in understanding our meditation is not to um, explain it away by a literal and naive application of Buddhist meditation terminology and concepts. Okay, so what I'm talking about is people will read a book and they'll read this is jhana, this is kanaka samadhi, this is nimitta or whatever, and they come and they sit meditation and something happens. Oh, this is that, this is the other, this is the other. Yeah, and so you've you've 
locked up and categorized your experience and put it into different things so to keep it safe. You've tamed your experience. Yeah? Don't do that. That's a big mistake. Because once you've tamed that experience, it's never the same again. It's never that fresh experience, that fresh reality. So we shouldn't think of these things as being um, like cut and dried ontological categories whose goal we are to sort of go into one from the other. They are the attempts by the Buddha and by other meditators to use whatever language and concepts were accessible to them in order to make real, to manifest, to communicate an inner experience. That's all. It's their attempt to communicate their own inner experience. And to use that properly is to, uh, is to, to keep pointing back at that experience itself. Now, the, 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 the teachings and the sort of the gradations and all of these kinds of things in Buddhist meditation, they all have a purpose. They can help us certain things, but we have to hold them very, very lightly. We have to remember that they are like a, 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 a generalization of experience. Our experience is not going to be exactly the same as that, and it shouldn't be. There's also this important things that those teachings omit. There are things which are not talked about within Buddhist meditation, but that may become very real, you know, for us. I mean, so for example, uh, you know, it's quite often that people will be meditating and maybe they have a, uh, an image of some kind of childhood trauma which sort of comes to them and, they, they, you know, they've got this thing. And it can, well, that's not talked about in Buddhism. There's no Buddhist text that tells you how do you deal with kind of a, a, mem a repressed memory of, of, of being abused as a, as a five-year-old child. Right? There's nothing in Buddhist texts that tell you that. But it's a reality. It happens, and not uncommonly. So you can't rely on the text to tell you everything. They can give you certain guideways and certain signposts. Yeah? But always remember, keep an eye on that balance. If you feel that, if, if you're getting too much into that uh, stressful, anxious kind of samadhi headache thing, you know, concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. Yeah. And, you, and the meditation, oh, meditation gives me a headache. <laughs> well, no, <laughs> not meditation gives you a headache driving, forcing the meditation, that gives you a headache. Yeah. So that's one extreme. Another extreme is to say, well, I'm going to do letting go and acceptance, but then do you just become lazy? Yeah. Are you just falling asleep in your meditation? Do you not have any framework? Do you not have any impetus? Yeah. So you have to recognize that for yourself. And that happens from moment to moment within your meditation. It will change during one meditation itself. So you have to learn these things, try to understand about yourself. What's your tendency? What do you need to do? You can try. What's actually useful is you can try bouncing around between the extremes a bit, right? To start with, yeah? Go and do some kind of really intensive meditation course where they're going to tell you, meditate, meditate, meditate. And they're standing there with a big stick and they're going to hit you if you say anything. Go and do that, yeah? And also go and just spend a week just sitting on a beach doing nothing. Not, not even trying to meditate. And you just learn from those things, learn from those experiences that, that, oh, actually, there might be a different kind of piece or a different quality of thing might come from different, different kinds of experiences. And as you learn from those extremes after a while, you can gradually know what's the right balance for you. So that's my little talk for this evening on striving and acceptance. And I'd like to invite any comments or questions.